This title is deceptive. It's, it's called The Body as One Man, but really, I mean, it's, it is about the body being one man. It is. But it's more than that. It's more than that. It's, it's about unity, which is something that uh, I was talking about it with Rebecca on the way here. Two times in my entire life, been a believer 40 uh, years, two or three years, 42 or three, 43 years. Two times in my entire life, I have felt true unity with a whole bunch of people. Two times. And I've been in thousands and thousands of services. Thousands and thousands of them. And hundreds of uh, conferences and meetings. You know, where there's a thousand Messianic Jews jumping and singing and, you know, whatever. And two times in my life, I've really felt true unity. <clears throat> what most people think is unity is not unity. It's not. It's mostly psychological, and it's mostly uh, sociological, which means a bunch of people doing the same thing. But there's unity in orgies. They're doing the same thing. They're feeling the same thing. And a lot of them, if you talk to them afterwards, people go to orgies and do that, you know, like as their lifestyle. They talk about feeling incredible unity. There's unity in um, uh, satanic churches. I mean, like literal satanic churches where they worship Hasatan. And they talk about the unity. Witches talk about unity. All believers talk about unity in their services. It's mostly psychological because we're all thinking the same thing. We're all on the same page. Unity is not being on the same page. That's not what it is. That's not what unity is. Unity is something completely, completely different. That's really what this teaching is about. Uh, and, and, you know, you're just going to have to trust me. I've been around a long time. I've been in many, many services. I've been in every situation you can imagine amongst believers. Every situation. I can't think of one I haven't experienced. And in none of them did I feel unity. Only two times in my life. And it was very unexpected when I felt it. What I felt, and... I don't know if I should say more or just say it here because I don't know if I've communicated what I really want to communicate. Real unity was created by God as a thing. It's a real thing. So maybe as we go through it, maybe I can paint a really clear picture of what unity really is. And then I'll say it, and then you'll understand why I say it. I've never felt it before except two times. Um, so we are, we are in Yitro which is a Gentile priest who was, by the way, a Rastafarian, Lutheran, uh, Catholic, Jew, Baptist, Mormon, throw me another one. Scientologist, Scientologist. thank you. Yeah, he, he knew them all. He'd done them all, and he was the master of all of them, except for Judaism. I shouldn't have thrown that in there. He had mastered all of them. And this is a Gentile piece. Now, this is a Torah portion named after a Gentile. He's the only one in the whole Torah who's a Gentile, and the Torah portion is named after him. So he's a big deal. It's a big deal that, that a Torah portion is named after a Gentile priest of Hasatan. So, obviously, something had to change. Something did change. This is what we're going to focus on, the emboldened part. Now, Yitro, the priest of Midian. Now, Midian is in Saudi Arabia, and they were uh, enemies of Israel, big enemies of Israel. The father-in-law of Moshe heard of everything God had done for Moshe and for his people Israel, and how the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Yitro, Moshe's father-in-law, together with Moshe's sons and wife, came to him in the wilderness at the camp near the mountain of God. Now you need to remember that Moshe lived there near the mountain of God. Uh, Yitro's camp, it's still there. 
Yitro's houses, his caves, his, his grave, it's still there, um, about 30 miles from Har Sinai, 30 miles from uh, what's called Jebel Al-Laus, the real Mount Sinai, Sinai. It's about 30 miles from there. So this is where, where Moses fled from Paro to live. And that's where he got his wife, from the children of this priest of the mountain of God. Yitro is not unfamiliar with the mountain of God. He knows it's the mountain of God. Nobody else knew, but he knew. And the burning bush that Moshe saw, that was at the mountain of God. And this is really, really important because God tells them the whole purpose of this exercise of the, of the Exodus is to bring you back here to the mountain of God. So that's, what they're, that's where they're at. They're right near there, right near the mountain of God. And Yitro goes and visits, and it ain't far from his house. Yitro was happy to hear about all the good Yehovah had done for Israel in rescuing them from the hand of the Egyptians. And he said, blessed is Yehovah. How's he going to do that? He doesn't know who Yehovah is. Well, now he does. Because they saw all the stuff that God did. And now what he's going to say is, you know, I've seen it all. I've seen it all. I've done it all. I know every God. I know every demon. I've mastered them. Now I know the real thing. Now I know the real thing. Now I know that Yehovah is greater than all the gods. Now I know because of everything that happened in the Exodus. Splitting of the sea, the ten um, makot spankings that God sent to Egypt. Now I know because I saw this, that God, Yehovah, is the real deal. So I'm switching. I'm switching. I'm switch allegiances. So here's what... Here's what uh, Rashi says, quoting the Mechilta, which is an ancient, ancient text of pictures. It's all filled with pictures, the Mechilta. And it says, then all other gods. What does he mean by that? This teaches us that Yitro was knowledgeable about every type of idolatry, everything. Everything there is in the world. There is no pagan deity that he did not worship. So anybody from all the nations could come to him. And he was the pope. He was the high guy. He was the one who was in charge of all the demons. And he told people and taught people how to worship him. So he's switching. Now what, the, what all the sages say, they all say it, that he converted. He converted to Yahadut, to Judaism. He converted to Judaism. All the rabbis say, I have these all listed, all the sayings of the rabbis, and I just, I just got rid of them because I needed to streamline the teaching. But you can do the research yourself, and you can see what the rabbi said. Every single one of them, and there's rabbi after rabbi after rabbi after rabbi that say and use scripture to prove it that he converted to Judaism. So then he says, right after that, then Yitro, Moshe's father-in-law, brought, what? Brought an, do you guys know how to bring an Ola to the temple? A, a burnt offering? Do you know how to sacrifice the animal? Do you know how to cut it up in pieces? Do you know how to skin it? Do you know how to remove, yeah, skin it properly? Do you know how to, how to kill it properly? That's a big deal. That's a big deal. Do you know which way to turn its head when you slaughter it? Then you don't know how to slaughter properly. Do you know how to clean it of blood properly? Do you know how to cut it up in its pieces? Do you know what the pieces are? Do you know how to get the pieces up on the altar? It's extremely complicated to, to offer any sacrifice. Now the Ola, I mean think about this. He taught all the Gentiles how to worship their demons and how to make sacrifices and, and offerings to their demons. But he doesn't know how to do it the Jewish way, does he? Well, now he does. A couple verses later, now he does. So all the rabbis go, what? How does he know how to do that? Because he's a Gentile priest of demons, and he's offering an ola 
and shlamim. You think an ola is tough to do? Shlamim is even more complicated. What parts do you eat? What parts do you burn up? What parts do you give to the other priests to eat? Do you wash the, in, the guts, the innards, or do you not wash them? It's called swilling. Do you wash the legs, or do you not wash them? Do you just offer them up? It's very, very complicated. But he's doing this in front of Moses and the, and the priests, the guys who are going to be the priests, Aaron and his children. Do you understand what I'm saying? All of a sudden, he has knowledge on how to do it. So the rabbis go, say what? How does he know how to do Yahadut, Judaism, Yahadut? How does he know how to do it? Because sacrifices and offerings are Yahadut. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Same way Abraham knew. God spoke to, Ab uh, to Isaac and said, all the Gentiles of the earth will be blessed. Why? Because Abraham listened to me and kept my mishma'at, my watch, watches, that means like the festivals, like the times of God, all the times of God, the Shabbat, when does it start, when does it end, all the festivals, my mishma'at, my uh, translated commandments, shouldn't have done that, but whatever, the commandments, the mitzvot, the statutes, the chokim, and the Torah. That is all of Judaism. All of it. So when you say Torah, 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 there's a whole lot to this. How do you know how to do it? And here's the problem. Uh, Lynn told us that story last week about she wanted to do it, but she didn't know how to do it. And so all she heard was something from God, and so she did it how she thought best. And then I came along and said, what are you doing? This is, we've been doing this for 4,000 years. No need to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to. We've already got it. All you got to do is learn what we know. That's all you got to do. And she started learning what we know. But I want you to see, don't miss this. Abraham, 430 years before the Torah was given, didn't just do the Torah. He did the details of it. The Mishma'at, the Mitzvot, the Chokim, and the Torah. Do you know which ones are the Chokim? Which ones are the statutes? Do you know which ones are the Mishma'at? Do you know which ones are the, uh, the uh, Mitzvot? They're not all Mitzvot. They're not all Chokim. They're not all Torot. They've got different names, like different, quote, laws have different names. Do you know which ones they are and what they are? He did. And then um, this amazing, amazing statement from Ramban, not Rambam, which is Maimonides. This is Ramban with an N on the end, which is Nachmanides. He was a Spanish. He was the head of the Spanish Jewry, Spanish Jewish community in the 11, 1200s, early 1200s. And he said, "It seems to me that from the opinion of the sages, Abraham learned. Look what he says." the entire Torah, the entire Torah from the Ruach HaKodesh. So if people are so hungry for the Ruach HaKodesh to teach them and to speak to them, why aren't they doing what the Holy Spirit teaches? The Mishma'at, the Mitzvot, the Chokim, and the Torah. And it's a real simple answer. Sociology and psychology. We do what we're taught. We do what the, you know, what the group around us forces us to do. Sociologically, we want to fit into the group. So we do what they do. That's why everybody does everything. Habit. But not so with somebody who wants to know God. And I know from my own life, that I've had to break from the pack five, six times. And it is extremely uncomfortable. It's horrible. You lose friends, you lose influence, you lose money, you lose everything. And I've done it, uh, I believe, five times, maybe four. Four or five times. It's horrible. 
But if you want to know God, listen, if you really want to know God, I mean really, you're going to have to do something different. Because obviously what you've done so far hasn't worked. Because you've still got a hunger inside or else you wouldn't have a hunger inside. So when we got a hunger inside to know God, we've got to do something different. That's what Abraham did. That's what Yitro did. He converted. I'm not telling you to convert. I'm telling you to convert. I don't even know what the net word for convert is in Hebrew. I had to have Rebecca look it up in Hebrew for me on Google Translate. Never even heard the word my whole life. The word in Hebrew for con convert and convert. I don't even know what it is. She told me I instantly forgot because I'd never heard it. I know teshuva, to return. That's different. Converting is different. Converting is different. Converting is what teshuva used to be. But they put a label on it and they called it convert. It never says in the Bible he converted. It, it would say he did teshuva and he changed. So I can't tell you what the word for convert is, but I know this, you got to change. I know that. So now let's talk about the purpose of the Exodus. I told you that the whole thing, the whole scenario with uh, Yitro and Moshe took place there at Mount Sinai in Saudi Arabia. That's where they lived. He fled to, to Mount Sinai, to Saudi Arabia. He lived there for 40 years, raised kids, had a wife, raised sheep and goats for his, his uh, father-in-law, uh, Yitro, who was the priest of Hasatan. And then he went to Egypt, did all the miracles. He comes back to his father-in-law and he said, and his father-in-law goes, wow, this, this is mind blow. This is the real guy. Yehovah is the real deal. I want that. And he changed his whole life. And he, quote, converted. He became a Jew. He became a Jew. So, what's the whole purpose of the exercise of the Exodus? Moshe said to God, who am I that I should go to Paro and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Where is Moshe when he's saying this? In Exodus 3. Where's Moshe when he's saying this? He's, he's, at, he's near Mount Sinai at the burning bush. This is right near Mount Sinai at the burning bush. Okay? And he says to God, who, who am I? I should go to Paro and bring the Israel out of Egypt. And God said, I'm going to be with you, and here's a sign for you. Here's the sign. Here's, here's how you're going to know that it's me talking to you. It is I who sent you. When you've brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this mountain. He's right at Mount Sinai, right near there. And he says, I'm going to bring you back to Mount Sinai. There you're going to know. You're going to know it's me. Now, this is kind of hard to follow, this, uh, this uh, little conversation here from in, Judea's, in Jewish writings. Concerning what you asked... What merit does Israel have that they should go out of Egypt? So it's like entering into the conversation between God and Moshe. Concerning what you say, what merit does Israel have that they should go out of Egypt? I have a great thing dependent on this exodus, God says. For at the end of three months from their exodus from Egypt, they are destined to receive the Torah on this mountain. It's not just you're going to come back to this mountain. You're going to come back to this mountain and get the thing, the Torah and the Holy Spirit, because they're the same thing. All of us have our, our minds split. All of us do. Everybody does. I know this because I live in America. All of our minds are split. There's Torah and then there's Ruach HaKodesh and never the twain shall meet. And so what we do is we cherry pick. Ooh, I like that from the Torah. I like that from the Torah. I like that from the Torah. I'm going to clothe my belief system with these little decorations. That's not going to get you to know God. I know what I'm talking about because I did the same thing. 
We all do it because we're taught it from the time we're children. Torah and Holy Spirit are separate. I, I, I talk to people all the time and I'll say, Torah, 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 I'll talk about stuff from the Torah, and they'll say, yes, but the Holy Spirit, because we all have a, we're split because of our culture. It's just, we're all like this. So, he says, at the end of three months, you're going to come to this mountain, and I'm going to give you the Torah. You're going to receive the Torah on this mountain. When you take them out of Egypt, you will serve God on this mountain, for you will receive the Torah on it, and that's the merit that will stand up for Israel. Now, this is kind of hard to follow. We don't know what that means now. This is the merit that will stand up for Israel. What does that mean? That means all that matters about Israel is one thing, that they have the Torah. That's all. That's it. You can strip away everything else about the Jew, about Israel, but they have this one thing, the Torah. That's it. They might be the stupidest jerk in the world. They can't even remember the prayers. And yet, got the Torah. That's the one thing we have that stands in our merit. That God looks down and goes, you got that. So the question is, how did we get it? Because Jews don't, I mean, Jews in America don't do Torah, do they? Not really. Especially American Jews. We do what we want. We don't do Torah. So how did we get it? I'm just going to talk about the three months. Now, God promised this over and over. When they were in Egypt, they never said, Moshe never went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go that we may go across, way across the Sinai Peninsula and then cross the, 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 the sea and then into Saudi Arabia. He never said anything like that. He said every time the same thing. We're supposed to go three days journey. Well, it wasn't three days. How long was it? At the end of three months, you're going to come back here. That's true. It was three months. Three months and three days. So, they never said anything about three months. They always said three days. Exodus 3, the elders of Israel, God says, the elders of Israel will listen to you. Don't worry, they're going to listen. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt and say to him, let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness. Why didn't he say three months? The plan was three days. It turned into three months. Kind of weird. Exodus 5. The God of Hebrews has met with us. Let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to Jehovah. Exodus 8. We must take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices. And there's the trip. There's, there's the map. They go across basically the middle of the... Sinai Peninsula. By the way, Sinai, Sinai Peninsula has always been Egypt. When we gave it back in, what was it, 50, 54 or something, 56, when we gave uh, the Sinai Peninsula back to Egypt, everybody freaked out. Not in Israel. They said, hey, it's not ours. We took it in war. We'll give it back. It belongs to Egypt. It's always belonged to Egypt. This Sinai Peninsula is not like no man's land. It's Egypt. So they crossed over that part of Egypt, and they crossed the Reed Sea at Nueba Beach, and then they went in this kind of circuitous route to Mount Sinai. But they always set a three-day journey into the wilderness. So the purpose of the redemption. Now, when I say redemption, you because of you know, your background, you probably think something different than Jews do. When we say redemption, we mean the exodus. That's what Jews mean by redemption. That's when God redeemed us. That's when he redeemed the whole of Israel. We were redeemed at Mount Sinai. That's when God made his covenant with us. So that's the covenant you're grafted into, Mount Sinai, which is where God gave what? That's the covenant that Gentiles are grafted into through Yeshua. 
the Torah, the covenant with God at Mount Sinai. That's the one. That's the big one. It's not the covenant of Abraham. It's not the covenant of David. It's not the covenant of Jacob or whoever else. The big one to the Jewish people is Mount Sinai. That's Shavuot. So the whole purpose of the Exodus was to get that Torah. And Torah is, how do you say Judaism? Anybody remember? In Hebrew, anybody remember how to say Judaism? I just said it. Yahadut. Say Yahadut. Yahadut. The whole purpose, the whole purpose of the redemption was to get Yahadut, to get Torah. Now I'm going to say this again. Torah and the Spirit are exactly the same thing. Easiest way to prove it is Abraham. The Holy Spirit taught him Torah. Right? Yes. Easy, easy, easy. The Holy Spirit taught him Torah. Why didn't the Holy Spirit teach him about Yeshua and the body of Christ? Does that make sense? Think about it. Think about what I'm saying. If the Holy Spirit was teaching Abraham, why didn't the Holy Spirit teach Abraham about the gifts of the Spirit and how it works in the church? Right? If it's the Holy Spirit talking, why didn't the Holy Spirit teach Abraham about the body of Christ and how to do communion and, uh, I can't even, baptiz baptism. Why didn't he teach him about baptism into the church? You just use your brain. Just think about it for a minute. The Holy Spirit is teaching a Gentile. And what does he teach him? Mitzvot, Chokim, Mishma'at, Torot. It's crazy. But that's what the Holy Spirit teaches. Always and forever. And so God takes this whole messed up, disorganized, beat down, ignorant, incredibly ignorant people, the Jews, to one place, why? To give them the Torah. That's the whole purpose. The whole purpose. So, Exodus 19, they come to Mount Sinai. <clears throat> this is what you are to say to the seed of Jacob and what you are to tell to the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen, and then he says, you've seen how I brought you out of Egypt on eagles' wings, etc. And then it says, if, now some of your translations will say, if you listen obediently, I think. I think that's what it says. If you listen obediently uh, to my voice and keep my covenant. I'm not sure how it says it, but it uses the word obedient. What it says in Hebrew is shmoa tishmu b'koli. Tishmoa, shema, shema, tishmoa. If you listen, tishmu, same word. If you listen with listening, if you listen with hearing, if you hear with listening, translate it however you want. But they're both the same word, bakoli, in my voice. If you listen with hearing in my voice and keep my covenant, what covenant? He hasn't given it yet. He's about to give it. He's about to give it, and it's the Torah. You will, if you do that, you'll be to me a segula. Say segula. I love this word segula. It means treasure. It'll say a treasured people, I think, in the Bible. It doesn't say that. It, doesn't say, it just says you'll be to me a treasure out of all peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you will be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation if you listen with listening to my voice or in my voice. So I'm telling you how Jews think. I'm telling you how rabbis read. We read this and we go, so then why did you bring us here? It's to get this covenant of the Torah. That's the whole purpose, bottom line. Now listen, listen to what I'm saying. This is, gonna, this is gonna brainwash you if you listen. It'll, brain, it'll wash your brain from the dirt that has been put there of this 
dichotomy, the splitting of Torah from spirit. They are not separate in any way, shape, or form. The Holy Spirit got his, his, his people and brought them three months, it should have been three days, but at three months because they did everything wrong, brought them three months to Mount Sinai. Why? To give them the Torah. The Holy Spirit did that. Are you with me so far? Yes? No? It makes sense? Okay, I'm doing my best. I'm tracking. So, what's the focus of the redemption? Torah. Yes? In the New Testament, Torah is not called Torah. It's called Moses. It's called Moses. The Torah was given through the hand of Moshe. Now here's, if you're going to get freaked out, here's where you're going to get freaked out. <laughs> so I'll prepare you, because the slide is coming up, what's going to freak you out. So I'll prepare you. We're not supposed to believe in Christ. We're supposed to believe in Moses. And through Moses, have faith in Messiah. Listen to me again. You got to listen. Because I'm, I'm, I'm saying these words very carefully. Because I'm trying to communicate. I'm not trying to say stuff to you. I'm trying to communicate something to you. That's in the scriptures. And it's very clearly in the scriptures. We are told. We are not told to believe in Christ. Ever. We're told to believe in Moses. Which is Torah. And thereby get faith in Messiah. Understanding. That's right. That's right. Faith is understanding. It's not stupidly going along with something. That's sociology and psychology. Do you understand what I'm saying? The, the main reason that people do things in the religious world has to do with sociology, the group that we're in, where we're raised, what we're taught, and then psychology, what people tell you, what people impress on you, what people make you believe and think. But the Torah isn't like that. The Torah doesn't do that. The Torah lays out very clearly patterns. Two, four, six, what's next? How do you know? That's faith. In Judaism, that's faith. That's how emunah works. Two, four, six, I know what's next. That's faith. It's not like some convoluted game you gotta play. You know, if I believe really hard, uh oh, a bad thought came in, I gotta, oh my God, I gotta think different. It's not like that. You look at the pattern and you go, okay, I know what's next. This is the pattern. God got Abraham, brought him to Torah, and taught him Torah. Yes? 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 God got the Jews, brought them out of Egypt, and brought them to Torah. Yes? yes. What do you think he's going to do with his body? Hopefully. Two, four, six, we know what's next. Now, if somebody doesn't go in that direction, it's simply because of sociology and psychology. That's it. It's not religion. So when you're talking with people, you're not talking about religion, you're talking about sociology and psychology. And so people get all mad and they start getting freaked out and they, and they argue and they cry and they you know, spit and moan and whatever. You know, we've all done that. We've all done it. It has nothing to do with scripture. This is what scripture says. I'm going to bring you and give you Torah. And if you listen to me, great. You'll be part of the covenant. So Hebrews 3 says this. I've taught this before. And this verse is really confusing for a lot of people. Hebrews 3, 1 through 3. Talking about Yeshua. Calls him our apostle and high priest. He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moshe was faithful in all God's house. 
Yeshua has been found worthy of greater honor than Moshe. Why? Because the builder of the house is greater honor than the house. This is a, if you can't track this logic, there's something wrong with your analogy skills. It's really simple. It says Yeshua is the house builder, Moses is the house. Not Christ is the house. Moses is God's house. What's Moshe? Torah. Torah. Torah is the house. Make sense so far? It's a simple analogy, and that's what he's saying. He's saying a simple analogy. The one who builds the house is greater. That's Yeshua. The house itself doesn't have as much glory because it's the house, the thing that got built. And that's Moses. You ever saw that before? That Moses is God's house? It's not a picture. It's an analogy. It's an analogy. It's, a, it's just a simple one plus one is always two. The builder of the house is greater than the house. Yeshua is the builder of the house. The house is Moshe. Simple. No picture, no metaphor, no secret, no you know, mental gyrations. Simple. Moses is the house. You've already always been taught that Yeshua is the house, right? The body of Messiah is the house. Moses is the house. Church. Or the church is the house, right? In the House of Congress, they have a picture of Moshe on the wall. Really? I didn't know that. A sculpture? A relief? Yeah. All right. So, this is pretty trippy. I mean, you probably know this. But you, you got to really, you know, suck on the gumball for a while. Get the, get the sugar off. Really think about this. You know, meditate on it. Chew on it. This is a big one. Moshe is the house, not Yeshua. Yeshua built the house. And the house is Torah. So if you want to say the house of God is the body of Messiah, you're right. It's Torah. The body of Messiah is Torah. The body of Messiah is Israel. It always has been. And I will prove it to you. The body of Messiah is not like some separate thing from the Torah. It is the Torah. Without Moshe, without Torah, there is no house of God. Without the Torah, there is no house of God. If this is true, and if we can believe the writer of Hebrews, either he's a nutbag, or this is what it says. That without Moshe, there is no house of God. Without Torah, there's no house of God. If you believe Hebrews 3, and that's going to be up to you. Lynn, is your hand up? Yes, ma'am. There is. It's in Ephesians that he is the head of the body. That is correct. That's a slightly different uh, thing because we're not to the body yet. We're at the house right now. Good class participation. Torah, if this is true, that if there's no Torah, there's no house. That means that Torah is supposed to fill that house. Yeah? Torah is supposed to fill the house. All right, let's talk about the revelation of Mount Sinai. I prepared you for this, so it shouldn't freak you out too much. Moses went up to God. I got arrows, so you can see. He went up. Do you know how many times he went up and down? Anybody know? On Shavuot? Seven. Seven times. Moshe went up to God, and Jehovah called to him. He says, tell uh, Beit Yaakov, tell the sons of Israel, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. If you will listen with hearing to my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be my own possession, my segula, my treasure among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. 
And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy goy, a holy nation. These words you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So Moshe came and called to the elders of the people. That means he went back down. He went down, he called to the elders and set before them all these words which, which Yehovah had established to him. And Moshe brought back, went back up, all the words of the people to Yehovah. He's the messenger boy going back and forth. He said to Moshe, I will come to you in a thick cloud so all the people can hear when I talk to you and may also have faith in you, Moshe, forever. Well, that's for the Jews. That's, okay, that's, that's nice, but that's for the Jews. No, it's for the body of Messiah. So all believers everywhere can have faith in Moshe forever. That's why God did this. Isn't that a trip? What do you think of that? I mean, that's, that's amazing. Moshe's the house. Moshe is the house. Torah is the house. And God wants all men everywhere to know Moshe and believe in Moshe forever. And what is Moshe? Torah. You tracking with this so far? I'm going as slow as I can. If you need me to pull the reins in, just let me know. I'm going as slow as I can. If you got a question, interrupt me and ask. Don't interrupt me. Raise your hand and, and ask. So the point is, I'm doing all this smoke and fire and earthquake and hail and lightning and earthquake and all this. And by the way, that photograph of Mount Sinai, that's not a shadow on the top from the clouds. That is what it looks like. It's burnt. The whole top of the mountain has been burnt. And they've even cracked open the rocks on the top of Mount Sinai. And it's burnt on the outside. And on the inside, it's not. So he did all this, all this, you know, fireworks, so that everybody would believe in Moshe. That's why it was done. Do you understand what I'm saying? This, this is a trip. God's never come to earth before until he did this. And that's why it's called the revelation of God on Mount Sinai. Everybody saw him. Not just Jews, everybody. That's what we're going to talk about. It came about on the third day when it was morning that there was thunder, voices. The word is kolot. That's another way to say voices. Tongues. There was tongues and lightning flashes and a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud shofar sound so that all the people who were in the camp freaked out and trembled. Now Mount Sinai was all in smoke. Why? Because Jehovah descended upon it in fire and its smoke ascended like the smoke of a blast furnace. Not a furnace, a blast furnace. <laughs> Which is why it says when they heard the sound of the fire. Not saw, heard. They heard it like a blast furnace. And the entire mountain quaked violently when the sound of the shofar grew loud, louder and louder. When did you ever see a shofar get louder and louder? When Doug blows it, it gets softer and softer. <laughs> when I blow it, it quickly gets softer. It doesn't get louder and louder. It gets softer and softer. This is God blowing the shofar. And it gets louder and louder and louder and louder. It's only a couple words in Hebrew, but I don't know how long this took. Maybe it took minutes. And it just terrorized everybody. And why is he doing all this? To tell everybody, I want you to believe in Moshe forever. Here I am. I have brought my people to this. What is this? Torah. And then, when the sound of the shofar got louder and louder, Moshe spoke, and God answered him with tongues. Kolot, plural. Kolot. Jehovah called Moshe to the top of the mountain. So now Moshe goes up again, and he said, go down, tells him to go down again, warn the people, go down and come up. And 
He tells them to go down and then come up. So, and Aaron with you. So Moshe went down to the people and then he tells them everything and then he comes back. Uh, no, now he stays down. Now he stays down for the 10 words. Now, here's the thing. What did God give on, on, on Sinai, I mean, on, uh, uh, on Shavuot? What did he give? We say, he gave the Torah. What did he give, really? Okay, but really, like, what did he give? The Ten Commandments. I mean, really, if you think about it, the big thing is he gave the Ten Words, right? It's not Ten Commandments. It's Ten Words. It never says Ten Commandments anywhere in the Scriptures. It never says Eser Ten Mitzvot. It never says that. It says Eser Devarim or dibrot in feminine, devarim in, in masculine, dibrot in feminine, Eserot, eserim dibrot, it's usually how it says it, ten words or ten things. But then he gave a whole bunch, 200 more, in next week's Torah portion, mishpatim, and it's still Shavuot. All right. So he says, uh, go back down, and then he gives the ten words. So here's what people usually don't know, that the Torah wasn't just offered to Israel. It was offered to all the Gentiles. Now think about this. God's pattern, two, four, six, what's next? Eight, we know this. The pattern is he got Abraham, he dragged him to himself because Abraham wanted to know God. And by the way, Abraham was a deep, deep idol family. I mean, this was like the big idol house. His family was the big idol sellers. And this is what God took him out of because he wanted to know God. So he took him out. And what does he do? He teaches him Yahadut, Judaism. Not just Torah. Not just Torah. All the other parts, too. So... Then he takes all of his people, Israel, his segula, his treasure. And what does he do? He brings them into the desert and he gives them Torah in the form of 10 words and then a whole bunch of others over the next few hours. Okay, now here's what people don't know. When God gave the Torah on Sinai, he displayed untold marvels to Israel with his voice. What happened? God spoke and the voice reverberated. It doesn't mean vibrate, it means split. That's what reverberate means here in the Hebrew. It means split. The voice split throughout the whole world. It says, and all the people saw the thundering, the voices, saw the voices, saw the voices. Not heard, saw. It, it is not written sound here, but rather sounds, plural. Rabbi Yochanan said, God's voice, as it was uttered, would go out and split up into the 70 voices of the 70 languages. How do we know there's 70 uh, nations? How do we know that? Genesis. Genesis what? I don't know, you talked about Very good. Very close. <laughs> Genesis 6. Sorry, sorry, Genesis 10. Genesis 10, very good. Genesis 10 tells us what the 70 nations are. And God's voice split into what they saw, tongues of fire, and split to the 70 nations and offered the Torah to the Gentiles. Because God loves everybody. But he doesn't offer them something else other than Torah. He only offers them Yahadut, Judaism. That's it. That's all he ever offers anybody. So, think in your mind. Here, I'll make it easy for you. Think in your mind of Mormon missionaries. That's easy. Go out in twos. They're apostles, shlachim, sent out in twos with a message. The message is always wrong, always, unless it is Yahadut, unless it's Judaism, Torah.
Period. Because that's what God did. And he offered it to Gentiles. Now, there's all kinds of stories in the Midrashim that say stuff like this. I'll just like give you a little one. When, when the voice split and it went to um, Edom, it offered the Torah to Edom. And, and, and Edom said, well, what's in it? What's in the Torah? And God said, you shall not, what was their big, you shall not kill. And Edom said, whoa, sorry. That's our, that's our go-to. <laughs> we can't, sorry, we don't want that. And then he goes to Moab and says, I'm offering you the Torah. And they say, well, what's in it? And God says, you shall not commit adultery. Nope. And there's all kinds of stories like that in the Midrash, Midrashim. So he offers it to all the 70 nations. But what's the trip here is that it's split into visible tongues of fire that they could see and they could hear. <laughs> God's voice as it was uttered would go out, split up in the 70 nations of the 70 languages so that all, all the nations, so that all the nations could hear. So that all the Gentiles could hear Judaism. That's God's heart. So hopefully that split between Torah and spirit is starting to come together. Because it is a split. God offered Torah to the Gentiles. He offered not just Torah. I don't want to say that anymore. Because I know how you are. I know how our minds work. Okay, Torah, that's ten words. Or, you know couple little things in the Torah, the things that I like to decorate my religion with. That's not what it is. It's all of it. All of it. The mishmarot, the, the mitzvot, I'm sorry, mishmarim. No, mishmarot, the mitzvot, the chokim, and the Torah. All of it. That's what was offered. And each and every nation would hear in the language of the nation. That's what it says in Acts chapter 2. When God spoke and he put tongues of fire on the believers, the Jews who are in the temple at Shavuot, doing Shavuot, it says the people were freaking out and said, we each hear them in our own language, tongue. It's exactly what this says here. Isn't that a trip? Yeah. That's right. There's no excuse. There's no excuse. That's exactly right. And each and every nation would hear it in the language of the nation, and their souls would <laughs> depart. What does that mean? That means they died spiritually. They died. They're rejecting the message. They're rejecting Torah. They're rejecting Yehudut. They're rejecting God's way. And so they die. Do you hear what it's saying? If somebody rejects Torah, their spirit dies, or their soul. Their soul dies. I won't say their spirit. I'll say their soul dies. Is your hand up? Yes. Panina. If that was true then, it's true now. That's right. So, during these years that we have left before the kingdom, this Come on. <laughs> Gentiles, and then also, you know, Jews, really, they have to come to Torah. Yes, everybody, well, well, let me say it this way, yes. In the slight time, the small time we have left until the kingdom, God promises he's going, to turn, he's going to make times of restoration, right, of all things. So before the kingdom comes, he's got to turn people's hearts toward Torah, both Jews and Gentiles, yes. Okay.
You realize the camera's just on me, right? <laughs> and I'm standing here going, mm. <laughs> All people in, um, the body are prophetic, the prophetic people, you say. They're talking about rest, restoration, recompense, and all Yes, all the body is talking about restoration. People are thinking about everything that the enemy has stolen. And I'm not yes. saying. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. God says stuff all the time. The problem is, we're so dumb, we think we know what he's saying. But we don't. And that's what I'm saying about unity. People who come together in a religious setting think they have unity, especially when the music starts. And then your emotions get involved, and it feels, oh, we're all one. And then they pray. And everybody's, oh, I was thinking the same thing. Problem is, God said something, but nobody knows what he's saying. Because he's using Jewish words, Jewish vocabulary. And without a Jew there to go, no, that's not, <laughs> that's not what that means. Which nobody is ever going to do. Because everybody's got sense. I don't. Everybody else has sense. But they'll never go, no, that's, that's ridiculous. That's not what it means. In Judaism, it's this. But without that teacher there to do that, everybody's up to their own thinking and their own devices. And so, now we're coming to the whole thing about unity. So what is unity? Why didn't God give a different message to, each, to Edomites and Moabites and Ammonites and Amalekites and... And uh, by the way, the Jews are another one of the goyim, one of the nations, one of the 70 nations. So why didn't he give a different message to each one? He didn't. He gave the same exact message, which is Yahadu, Judaism. All of it, the whole thing. And when he gave it, it would make sense that he would give something slightly different to Edom, slightly different to uh, the Philistines, slightly different to Africans, slightly different to uh, Cubans, slightly different to Americans. But he didn't. So what is unity? What really is unity? So let's talk about, uh, I, I don't want to offend anybody. I, I'm not trying to offend anybody. But we have to think rationally and clearly about what has been told to us and shown to us a billion times. And here I am, one time, saying it. So don't kill the messenger. We've got to think rationally about this stuff. Think about the phrase, body of Christ. And immediately, some of you picture the Eucharist. That's what it is, body of Christ. You're not familiar with that because you're German and you're a, you're a Lutheran so, or whatever. You don't do that stuff. These are Catholics we're talking to here. You know, you say body of Christ. What's the body of Christ? The Eucharist. Okay. There's... Really? There's no such thing as the body of Christ. It does not exist. It only exists in the writings in the New Testament. What was it before? In the culture of the Jews. What was it? Because, because obviously, you know, it's said, uh, what, uh, 55 times in the New Testament, body of Christ, right? But, but, and they don't argue with him and stone him. They go, yeah, okay, body of Christ. Yeah, we know what that is. They're all on the same page. How are they on the same page about body of Christ? In Jews, with Jews. You see what I'm saying? It's not like today. It was a Jewish world in which God gave Jewish stuff to Jews with Jewish words, and they all went, yeah, okay, I get it. And then Shaul, Paul, comes along and says, Guf HaMashiach, body of Messiah, and they're like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Because it had already been established at Mount Sinai. That's when it was established. Right there. 
They came to Mount Sinai. I'm going to prove it to you. I'm not just saying it. I'm going to prove it. When they came to Mount Sinai, God said, here's the unity. Here's the unity right here. Everybody believing in not the big you know, volcano going off, Moshe. An 80-year-old man. That's the unity. Moshe, who is Torah. I told you, in the New Testament, Torah is called Moshe, which I will show you. Are you with me? That's the unity. That's unity. I've only felt it twice in my entire life. That's the unity. I felt the unity of everybody on the same page about with Torah inside. Thinking about Torah, loving God for Torah, thanking God for Torah. I've only felt it twice. And I've been a believer 43 years. And I'm talking about when everybody's on the same page about it. This is God's unity. I'll prove it to you. In Exodus 19, 1 through 2, God says, red cow, red cow, red cow, red cow, blue cow. And he just flips everything and everybody goes, what? <laughs> Where'd that come from? And it's about unity. This is how he taught unity. He said one thing four times and he flips it and says something totally opposite. And by the way, you can look at this. Yeah, I'm going to let you do your own research. Hundreds of rabbis have written about this one I'm about to show you. Hundreds. Ancient, ancient rabbis. And then more modern. And then more modern and more modern all the way up to today. Exodus 19, 1 through 2. In the third month, they came. Who came? Who came? Israel. Israel. They. To the wilderness of Sinai when they departed. Who departed? Who departed? Who departed? Okay. <laughs> they came to the wilderness. Who's they? They encamped in the wilderness. Over and over again. They came, Ba'u. They departed, Yisau. They came, Yavo'u, uses a different word. Yavo'u. They encamped, Yachanu. And then all of a sudden, he flops it and says, and there he encamped. Very next word in the same sentence. Red cow, red cow, red cow, red cow, blue cow. They encamped in the wilderness, and there Israel, he encamped. They encamped is Yachanu, he encamped is Yichan Sham. There he encamped, Yichan Sham. Yichan, he camped, Sham, there. Why would God say all of a sudden it's one dude? When five times, four times he's told us it's a bunch of dudes. And all of a sudden he says it's one dude, one guy. One guy. Because they're in total, complete unity. And guess what? That's how Acts chapter 2 starts. And they were all in unity in, as one man in, 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 the, in one place. And the Holy Spirit was sent, as tongues of fire, etc. You know the story. But that's how it starts. And they were all lev echad. Had one heart. And by the way, that's what it says in Hebrew. If you look at a New Testament in Hebrew, in Acts chapter 2, it says, they were all levechad, one heart. You don't get that in the English. They were all together in one place. It doesn't say that. It says they were all levechad, one heart. One heart. That means one body. Right? One body, one heart. One body, one head. So who's the body? Israel. It's Israel and it's Moshe. What stands in our stead when God looks down at Israel and says, Ooh, I love you because you got that. What is it? Torah. It's a Torah. It's Moshe. That's the only thing that we got. We don't have anything frilly. We got nothing pretty. We got nothing to make you feel, Oh, that feels so good. There's, Judaism isn't that. It's... Nothing. It's just stripped down to nothing, and all we got is Judaism. That's it. That's it. 
You really want to know God? You got to have this kind of unity with us. Now, maybe, maybe it's starting to sink in what grafting in really is. Maybe, I hope. Grafting in is a huge, deep, difficult concept unless you're able to get your head wrapped around this. It's hard to understand. It's not a simple thing. Oh, we're grafted in to the Jewish root. Yay! It's, it's very, very complicated. And it's hard, especially for you, if you weren't raised with it. I wasn't raised with it either, by the way. But I know it's harder for you. So the real unity, the real unity is Moshe. It's Torah. That's unity. That's what God wants his people to have. They want them to be around the, the, the round table, the, the, around the same table with Judaism, with Yahadut, and talking about that stuff in common. And working that stuff out. That's what the believers, what God desires for the believers. All believers, everywhere. All. So this is a trip. I've only got a couple things written here. Three things. There's hundreds of them. Rashi says, Israel, he camped there as one person with one heart. One person with one heart. Israel is a dude. He's one guy. One guy. Not a million different guys. One guy. But all the other encampments were with resentment and dissension. Remember it said they went to this camp and this camp and this camp and this camp for three months and they finally got to Mount Sinai and all of a sudden they're in total and complete unity. Why? Because God's getting them ready to receive the Torah. Look at what in the Mechilta, remember I told you about Mechilta, fantastic book, it's full of pictures. Ancient, ancient book. It's by Rabbi Yishmael, and he says, The point of your singular God is to apprise us of the eminence of Israel. Now, that may bother you. I'm sorry, but that's what God wants. God wants the eminence of Israel. That means lifting something up, exalting it, making it big. And I'm going to say this again. There's nothing, nothing beautiful or pretty or exalted or fantastic about Judaism. Nothing. There's not, it's not, you know, yipping and, oh, we're wearing prayer shawls. Yay! That, that's, you know, that, that's done. We're done with that. That time is over. When people got all excited about, you know, let's put banners up and let's make, uh, you know, ribbons and all that stuff. That took, that's in 70s and 80s. Some in the 90s. We're done with that. God's <laughs> disco's dead. That's right. Now it's something else. Now God's doing something else. Now He's getting people to the real, the real meat, the real meat. We've left disco and we've gone on to classic rock, baby. And now it's the real thing. So He says the point, the point of your singular God, one God, one God, is to make the Jews like that dude, one basically what he's saying, to apprise us of the eminence of Israel, that when they all stood at Mount Sinai to receive the Torah, they were all one heart. So why in the world do you think this says this in the New Testament? Because the Jews had been saying this for 2,000 years already. 1,500, I'm sorry. 1,500 years already. So they were all of one heart to receive the kingdom of heaven with joy. Yay, the kingdom of heaven has come. We got the Torah. We got Moshe. The receiving of the Torah. Now, this is, this is from Yismach Yisrael writing about the Passover uh, Haggadah. The receiving of the Torah was only possible. The receiving of the Torah was only possible. Think about your background. Think about people you come from. Think about all the believers that you know. Think about the congregations that you've been
been to, visited, know of, been at, were part of. Think about it. The receiving of the Torah, and remember the Torah and the Spirit are one. The receiving of the Torah was only possible when the people had attained a state of unity. God cannot give his Torah if there's splits and disunity. The people camped together like one man with one heart. This is what the verse means. He did all these amazing acts before your, you know what it says? I. Before your I, not eyes. It says I, singular. He did all this before your I. Yeah, that's in Deuteronomy 4.34. So that you would attain a state of unity and become one group. Now, I am not teaching this today so that Lev Tzion can come together because we're fractured. That's ridiculous. I'm saying all of us together have made an enormous, enormous mistake. And we've believed it and we've followed it. I'm included. We've made a horrible, horrible mistake. We have not given Moshe his due. We haven't believed in him forever. And he is the Torah. Because when God gave the Torah, he offered it to the Gentiles first. And they said, no thanks. Okay, what about you, Israel? Thank you, God, we'll take it. All that he has spoken, we will do and then we'll listen. The receiving of the Torah was only possible when the people had attained a state of unity. That is an amazing statement. This unity was amongst both Jews and Gentiles. Mixed multitude, Gentiles, called Gentiles, called Gentiles. Over and over and over and over and over again in the New Testament. They're believers. They're grafted into the Jewish root, but they're called Gentiles. So what? So what? It means nations. There's 70 of them. And every one of those 70 nations were represented at Shavuot when God gave the Ruach HaKodesh and gave the Torah. He offered it to all of them. Ephesians 3 says this. Now, now, um, I don't know, that's now been revealed, he's talking about something, has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit. To be specific, this, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body. This was mind-blowing for the Jews, for the Messianic Jews in the first century. Mind-blowing. What? They rejected it. They rejected it. They don't want Torah. No, they're... They're coming in. They want it. But what do we do with them? I don't know. I guess we convert them like Jethro, like Vitro. Let's convert them. Okay, well, there's a guy. He's got to be circumcised. He's got to go in the mikvah, be circumcised. All right. What about the women? Well, they got to go in the mikvah for sure. We'll give them a new name. Give the guys a new name too. And then they'll start learning. Okay, let's convert them. Well, there's no word for conversion. Okay, well, what do we do with them? This is exactly how the book of Acts chapter 15 starts. A bunch of believers came down from Judah and said, there's all these Gentiles coming in. What do we, what do, we do with them? We've we got to circumcise them and turn them into Jews. And so Paul and Barnabas and Peter, they all have this gigantic fight. And Paul says, wait, 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 wait. Guys, God's been showing me that they're still Gentiles. And Peter goes, yeah, you know, he showed me the same thing. I had a dream where I saw a whole bunch of unkosher animals come down, and God said, there, there's your Gentiles. And don't call them unclean. Don't call the guys unclean. Okay. So they're still Gentiles? But they're in a Jewish house? Yep. Just like the mixed multitude. Now, this was mind-blowing for everybody. Yes? So they're Messianic Gentiles? 
I don't know. I don't know what to call them. They're Gentiles. You know, Joe Good, who taught me this, I said to him, how do you know all this Jewish stuff? And he said, well, I, I read. <laughs> I study the Jewish books. And I said, but you're a Gentile, right? Yes, I am. He never called himself a Messianic Gentile. He just said, yes, I am. But he was teaching me Judaism. And I said, you're a Gentile? Yes, I am, Michael. Michael. Yes, I am. I don't know. Why put a label? The only label that's in the, in the, in the, in the Bible says Goyim, Gentiles. But they're doing Judaism. Why put a label? Just leave it what it is. So he says, this is, this is it. This is the message that the Holy Spirit's showing. That the Gentiles, not, I don't know what else to call them. The Gentiles, <laughs> say it again. Present. Present, yes sir. Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body. What's the body? Moshe. Israel. Torah. Yeah, Israel. Moshe. Israel. It was already established, which I will show you. This is called the Israel of God. This is the teaching I did four weeks ago that was just so mind-blowing. What's the Israel of God? This is the Israel of God. The Gentiles come into a Jewish house and do Jewish stuff and get to know God. That's all. It's that simple. And they believe in Moshe forever. There he encamped, Yichan Sham, singular. Second Chronicles 30 verse 12 says this, Hezekiah is gathering all of northern Israel, those pagans, those disgusting Israeli pagans, all of northern Israel and all of Judah to do the Pesach. And also in Judah was the hand of God to give them one heart to do the mitzvot of the king. How did they get one heart? How did they get one heart? The hand of God, yeah, the Ruach HaKodesh, the hand of God gave them one heart. Not to just go do Pesach, to do the mitzvot, to do Judaism, Yahadut. And to do the word of the princes by the word of Yehovah. Now watch this, Isaiah chapter 1. Oi! Sinful nation. People burdened with iniquity, seed of evildoers, corrupt children. They have forsaken Yehovah, provoked the Holy One of Israel to anger. They're turned away from him. Where will you be stricken anymore as you continue in rebellion? There is no place to strike you anymore on your body. The whole head. If there's a head, what is it? It's a body. And it's Israel. This is the body of Messiah, Israel. The whole head is sick. The whole heart is faint. From the sole of the foot of what? A body. From the sole of the foot to the top of the head, there's no soundness. There's bruises. There's welts. There's raw wounds on every square inch of the body of Messiah. And it's Israel. Israel is the body of Messiah. Body of Messiah is not something that the Jews get to come into. The body of Messiah is Israel, and Gentiles get to come into it. Do you see what I'm saying? The whole thing has been flopped. This is what is called replacement theology, and it's in your head, and it's in my head. Because we've been told this our whole life. The body of Messiah is this magnificent thing that we invite the poor Jews into. No! The body of Messiah has always been since Israel. And the Gentiles are invited into it. Come do Torah. Well, what's in it? Quit being lazy. No thanks. I'll just take ten commandments. Thank you. And then maybe four. Well, okay, maybe two. Love your neighbor as yourself. And love God. Those two. I've been told that so many times by, by believers, I can't tell you. There, I tell them, there's 613 mitzvot. No, there's really only two. You shall love the Lord with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength. They don't say that, they say all your mind. 
and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's really all we need. That's lazy. And that's why people reject the Torah, because it's hard. It's hard work. So there's nothing in the whole body but welts and bruises and wounds. They haven't been closed. They haven't been bandaged. They haven't been softened with oil. The body is a mess. But you know what? It's a body. Yeah? It's a body. Yes? That's the body of Messiah. And look what we've turned it into. Body of Christ. Body of Christ. I only know this from movies, by the way. Body of Christ. I've never seen it in real life. Body of Christ. Body of Christ. I've been in one Catholic church one time in my entire life. They didn't do that. So I've only seen it in movies. This is what the body of God has been turned into. It's gone from Torah to a little piece of bread that you're not supposed to chew. I've been told this by believers that used to be Catholic. They would get, they would get the Eucharist on their tongue and they'd let it dissolve. And I said, why don't you just chew it? Oh no, that's the body of, body of Christ. I'm not, a, I'm not a cannibal. He was already in Messianic Judaism and he still was thinking this. You see what I'm saying? It's all conditioning, it's all psychology, it's all sociology, it has nothing to do with religion. It's all up here. So, then in the New Testament, there's all this stuff about the body of Messiah. Now that you know what it is, what is the body of Messiah? Israel with Torah. Romans 12, just as we have many parts in one body and all the body parts do not have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Messiah and individually parts of one another. Zebulun, Manashe, Judah, Simeon, Issachar. However, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, use them right. In prophecy, in service, in teaching, exhortation, one who gives with generosity, one in leadership, with diligence, one who shows mercy, with cheerfulness. Somebody quoted this verse to me and won an argument this week. They, they wanted to give to, to my family because of my wife's situation. And they wanted to give. And I said, no, 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 we, no, come on, come on. You got your own problems, you got your own life to live. Yes, but I, I read in Romans 12, and she, <laughs> I'm like, what does it say? And she quoted, I'm like, okay, you win. <laughs> this is my book, Torah and Spirit are One. Torah and Spirit are One. And it has this whole story laid out. So I'm not good at this. So if you're having trouble melding together the Torah and the spirit, if it's still split, this can help. This book can help you. Here, get it on the camera. So it says in here, an answer to this question. The body of Messiah is one man, but what man? Now when I think of this question, I immediately th think of circumcision. Because a, bo a circumcised body, a body is either, either circumcised or it's not circumcised. For centuries, it has been taught in the Christian world that Pentecost is the birthday of the church. Have you heard that? Yeah. Pentecost is the birthday of the church. It's been taught for centuries. Shavuot, we know, was the giving of the Torah. That cannot be possible if Pentecost or Shavuot is the repetition of the original pattern involving the nation of Israel. They were at the foot of Mount Sinai in the mountain of God, prepared and ready to be chosen as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. In Acts 2 at Shavuot, we're not reading about Christians in an upper room, but rather Jews in the temple. Just as Israel was about to receive the Torah in Exodus 19, true to the pattern, Israel was in the temple about to receive the Holy Spirit. So 
It says, um, I've heard from countless Bible teachers and pastors and preachers for over 40 years that it's talking about this split between Torah and spirit. I've heard this for, at this point, over 40 years. The narrative espoused so consistently from much of Yeshua's body goes something like this. The legalistic, angry Pharisees, busy with the minutia of rabbinic Judaism and engulfed in their religious spirit is what keeps Gentiles away from God. That's the narrative. It's not true. The truth is that God offered the Torah. He didn't offer the gospel. Well, actually, that's not true. The Torah is the gospel. He didn't offer what people think of as the gospel. He offered the Torah. And they didn't want it. They said, no, no. It's too much. What Jewish stuff is too much. I'll just take ten commandments. Thank you. All right. So the problem is that the body is circumcised. The body of Israel is circumcised, not uncircumcised. But the body of Messiah is uncircumcised, not circumcised. Do you see a problem here? The amazing event of Shavuot establishes the unity that can exist in the Messiah's body. However, that unity can only happen if the unity is around Moses. What's that? What do you think that is? Yep. The unit, no kidding. The unity can only happen, and you see how I don't give up? The unity can only happen if it's around Moses. Look what it says in 1 Corinthians. You think it's important to be baptized into Christ? Israel was baptized into Moses. Did you know that? They were mikvahed into Moshe. Israel is mikvahed into Moshe. So why isn't the body of Messiah mikvahed into Moshe? Our fathers were all under the cloud and they all passed through the sea. They were all mikvahed into Moshe. That's in the New Testament. In the cloud and in the sea. Is the bread which we break at Kiddush we can edit this out right maybe okay yes is the bread which we break now li listen it's talking about eating together on the festivals on the festivals, the new moon, and the Shabbat. That's what it's talking about. It's talking about the, the feast, the, the oneg. Thank you, Doug. Eating during doing Judaism. Yahadut. And it says, is the bread that we break not a sharing of the body of Messiah, which is Israel? In other words, we're eating during the festivals, we're supposed to be talking about Torah. Not anything else. Not anything else. Since there's one loaf, we who are many are one body. We are the loaf, because Israel is the loaf. For we all partake of the one loaf. Look at the people of Israel. That's the next words he says, but nobody ever quotes that. 
They quote this part about communion, right? But they don't say this. Look at the people of Israel. That's what it says. All right, other stuff about that. So, without the Torah, the body is not Messiah's body. I'm going to say that again. Without Torah, the body is not Messiah's body. It's somebody else's body. But it ain't Messiah's body. Exodus 19, so that the people may hear when I speak with you and may also have faith in you, Moses, forever. 1 Corinthians 10, they were all immersed into Moshe. They were all, did you ever see that? That they were all mikvah into Moshe? They ever hit you before? Gesund. They ever hit you before? That all of Israel was mikvah into Moshe, and so that's why we do the way we do. Paul is saying, Shaul is saying, we mikvah the way we do because all of Israel was mikvah into Moshe. So why are we, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, why are we doing that? It's craziness. It's two, four, six, thirty-three. It's just the wrong, it's not following the pattern. People should people should be mikvahed into Moshe and immersed, immersed in Torah. Immersed in it. Acts 15. This is what? Jacob, Hatzadik, Jacob the righteous said, after they had the big fight about what do we do with the Gentiles? I don't know. What should we do? Let's do this. I don't know. Should we do that? I don't know. Who knows? Well, Paul says this. Peter says that. Let's send them up to Jacob and let's talk about it. And this is what they came up with. It's my judgment that we don't cause trouble for those from the Gentiles. He doesn't say they used to be Gentiles. He says they're Gentiles. Fabulous! Edomites, Moabites, Americans, whatever. And they're coming to the God of Israel. And they're not saying, nope, can't do that. They want it. They want Judaism. They want it. Cool. Don't trouble them. Because they're turning to God from, from the Gentiles. People from the Gentiles but that we write to them to abstain from food contaminated by idols, from acts of sexual immorality, from animals that have been strangled. You don't know what that even means. That's a huge, these are the four biggies to give the Gentiles so they can live and then learn Judaism. No strangled animals. Did you think that's a big one? That's a big one. No strangled animals. And from eating blood. Because, let's do these four things, because, 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 for, therefore, let's do it because, for this reason. From ancient generations, Moshe has those who preach him. No, no, no. They don't preach Moshe in the synagogue. What do they preach? Torah. See what I said? It, Moshe, Torah is called Moshe in the New Testament. New Testament. In the New Testament, it's called Moshe. Hold on. Because from ancient generations, Moshe has those who preach him. Why? Because they believe in him forever. Let's send the Gentiles there. And he's read. He is read. No, he's not. The Torah is read. No, he is read in the synagogues every single Shabbat. They're gonna get it. They're gonna get it. Over time, they're gonna get it. But they're still called Gentiles. Don't let anybody tell you that Gentiles is bad. Don't let anybody tell you that you have to convert to Judaism. You do not. You do Judaism as a one of the 70 nations. That's all. Simple, simple, simple. It's just not simple to do. Easier said than done. But that's the bottom line. Yes, ma'am. If you want to know what these th four things mean, go study Judaism and find out. 
I, I'm not teaching this right now. I'm teaching what it means. What's the bottom line of all this? Because you need, we need to get our heads wrapped around this. Because we made a horrible, horrible mistake. Not believing in Moshe. Not preaching Moshe. Not teaching the nations, the Gentiles, offering them Torah so they can come to Yeshua. That means you've got to know how to show them Yeshua in the Torah. So, four statements here. I hope I've made these. I hope I've nailed them down. I hope I have. These are the four things that I'm trying to say, basically. The whole purpose of the redemption was Torah. God brought them, all of Israel, to Mount Sinai to give Torah. It's a big deal. Whole purpose of the redemption. Listen, when we read, when we do Pesach and we read the Haggadah, are you thinking, we're coming toward Torah? No, you're thinking, we're coming toward the end of the night. God, this is long. That's what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, God, can we eat already? My stomach is rumbling. Let's come on. What's, what is, what's all this? All this is to get toward Torah. The whole purpose of the redemption was Torah. Number two, God, had wa God wanted all of Israel plus Gentiles with them. The mixed multitude who are never called anything but. They're never called Jews. They're never called anything but mixed multitude Gentiles. It's okay. You belong. You belong. Even though you're a Gentile. No. I'm going to change that. Because you're a Gentile, you belong. It was offered to you first. Exactly right. It wasn't offered to us first. It was offered to you first. So, God wanted all of Israel, plus the Gentiles, to believe in Moshe, in the Torah, forever. Forever. You get what I'm saying? I hope you can hear me. Like, I hope it's changing. Well, maybe it should be up here. I, I hope it's changing the way you think about some things. Because this is the pattern. Number three. Torah, Moses, is the house of God. It is the body of God. And lastly, without Torah, the body is not Messiah's body. It's somebody else's. Because Messiah is circumcised. His body is circumcised. He's a Jew. Christians love to say this. I've been told this for 43 years. Oh, Jesus was a Jew. All the apostles were Jews. Okay, then why aren't you doing Judaism? That's the first thing that comes to my head. That's how twisted I am. That's how corrupt I am. The very first thing, and you know who taught me that? My mom. My mom's still like that. She taught this to me. I mean, so I've had it inculcated into my brain like an earwig. And so this is how I think. Christians say, oh, Jesus was a Jew, He's, you know, and all the apostles were Jewish. I just heard it six times this week. And I immediately think, then why aren't you being like him? I mean, it's kind of a simple kindergarten question, right? It's a simple, simple thing. So I want you to, I want you to start thinking in your heart differently. I want you to really consider this. You're gonna to have to chew on this for a while. Because this is, this is um, it's not, you know, simple, frilly stuff. Because I just heard myself speaking, by the way. And I thought, what are you doing? This is very complicated. So it's, it's a big deal. And I, and I hope that I've made it clear and given you enough to go study on your own and find out more, because there's tons more about this. And the more you seek about this, the more you're going to see we were lied to and very, very deeply lied to over and over and over and over again about what we're supposed to be believing. What we're supposed to be believing is Moshe. And through Moshe, we'll see Yeshua. Let's pray. 
Papa, thank you so much, so much for giving your patterns. And I thank you for opening our eyes to see the patterns, because that's your Ruach HaKodesh doing that. And I ask that you do that for your, your body, your body, all over the world, that you turn them to Torah, that you turn them to the Chokim, the Mishmarot, the Mitzvot, the Torah, that you turn them toward all the details of your Torah, not just sayings and bumper stickers, but really thinking about these things. I ask, Father, that as you bring us to the time of restoration of all things, that you would restore Moshe to his rightful place and exalt him in your body. And Lord, I ask for your forgiveness for me and for this body for not exalting Moshe. It's a, it's a grievous sin. It's a bad one. It's, it's awful. It goes against everything that you want, everything that you've shown, everything you've said, everything you've worked so hard to communicate and ask for your forgiveness in the name of Yeshua. Pour out your Ruach HaKodesh and your Torah as one. Amen. Let's stand for the Aleinu. Aleinu la shabeach la adon hakol Leted gedula la yotzer bereshit Shelo asanu kogoye haaratzot Velo samanu kemishpachot haadama Shelo sam chelkenu kahem Vegohor aleinu kakol hamonam let us adore the Lord of all, who in greatness created the world from of old, that he has not made us like the nations of the earth, not made us like the families of the land. He has not made our destiny like theirs, or cast our lot with all of them. And let's end it there. Shabbat Shalom. Let's do Kiddush.